Hello, this is uh, the video for sections uh, 13, 14, and 15 of uh, chapter 13 of uh, Cummings and Kaufman. In section 13, we go to neutron stars. We began discussing this in class. And neutron stars are the core of a uh, pulsars and they were discovered as such but now we know that uh, new, not not all the pulsars all the pulsars are neutron stars but not not all the neutron stars are pulsars what we know is that um, neutron stars are extremely dense they have uh, according to models they have a diameter of a good uh, 20 kilometers or so the the size of a small town for instance and they are extremely dense because they are a nuclear density and they have a um, certain structure that we can see here in this drawing they have a crust and then superfluid neutrons and then superfluid neutrons and superconducting protons this crust is uh, only about one third of a kilometer and there is a substructure here that we're going to discuss uh, next. Uh, neutron stars, they have a, a, a minimum of uh, 1.4 solar masses and they can go up to 3. This topic of, is of uh, special importance uh, in my case because uh, of uh, the studies that we have been performing in the last uh, uh, seven years or so along with colleagues from uh, the University of Buenos Aires and some of the students here we have um, I'm showing you this article here from uh, 2012 in which uh, we studied the structure of uh, the crust of neutron stars using the model known as molecular dynamics and basically uh, we use marbles with some interactions, some way of uh, interacting, representing protons and neutrons in different colors and how they interact at different densities and temperatures. And I'm going to give you an example next. This um, is a collection of protons and neutrons. You can pick your choice. White can be neutrons, blue can be protons and they, we have the same number and the system is being cooled down from a high temperature to a low temperature and you see it's, it's at a given density it's uh, less than normal density it's about one uh, about half of the normal nuclear density and you can see that as the system cools down it goes into some specific shape there are some holes that begin to develop some regions and begins to take shape this structure in particular is known as uh, the jungle gym structure and it is one of those things that you find in a in a park for kids to climb jump. Those structures, generally, generically speaking, 
are known as pastas and they have um, different shapes we see here three of them this is the result of our study that uh, we show that uh, for some densities in temperatures the protons and neutrons form these layers that are connected by these bridges and this resembles uh, an Italian dish, the lasagna, or at some other densities, and the density given here, this is uh, about one-tenth of the nuclear density, uh, we see that they form these long tubes that can be taken as the spaghetti. And these uh, little balls here and there, they can be taken as gnocchis. And And there was uh, the contribution of uh, our own studies. I failed to mention that, that the particular article that I presented was selected as uh, the article of the month by the journal, uh, the Physical Review. Well, um, coming back to the pulsars, the pulsars can radiate energy, and as they radiate energy, they begin to lose energy, they begin to cool down and slow down and at some point they um, because of uh, the slowing down the centrifugal, centrifugal force is going to be less uh, than it was before and there's going to be some rearrangement of the, the structures uh, of the surface of the neutron star and they can have um, kind of earthquakes but um, instead of being earth quakes is pulsar quakes and we can see here this is the period of oscillation as a function of the month and this for one specific case the Vela pulsar in 1975 and in 1976 and then at some point the period went back into a lower period and then continued growing you can see that it is increasing the period which means that the velocity is decreasing the rotational speed is decreasing and uh, this happened, it, it's uh, this pulsar glitch. It, it happened because the neutron star suddenly uh, uh, went to a faster speed as uh, some of the mass got rearranged. There's also, just like uh, we have binary systems, uh, we can have uh, binary pulsars. Most of the pulsars are isolated, but there are some that um, that have companions, not necessarily neutron stars, and these are known as binary pulsars. And there are some that are two pulsars uh, bound to one another. And um, these, uh, this is one, one of uh, such binary systems, the PSR uh, 1916 with 13, and this, uh, what they have is uh, two pulsars uh, uh, orbiting one another, and, and since they are extremely dense, they um, are uh, spiraling towards uh, each other. And this is another representation of a different uh, pair of pulsars. In this one in particular has a 2.8 uh, second period of oscillation between the two. And um, they have um, they provide an interesting uh, opportunity. These two happy fellows decided to study a pair of pulsars, and being that they are so massive, being that they are so close, then they figure that they should be uh, producing gravitational waves. So they studied the energy predicted by Einstein theory of relativity the energy that would be lost by the pair as it uh, orbits one another. And this tells you the, the shift in the period as, it, uh, as the, the pair continues to orbit as a function of time. And as you can see, it matches precisely the predictions of uh, the general relativity. Because of this, um, Taylor and Holsey it shared the Nobel Prize in 1993. Gravity waves, uh, this cannot be taken as a direct confirmation of the existence of gravity waves. This is a secondary result, 
but Gravity Boys were discovered in 2016, and they also received the Nobel Prize in 2018. Um, there are some other pulsars that pull mass from their companions and then speed up. And these are the millisecond pulsars. They, they rotate uh, extremely fast. And uh, I'm going to run a video here. I'm going to insert a video that tells you a little bit about these milli. A normal pulsar that comes from a supernova will tend to last somewhere between 10 and 100 million years. Well, if you think about it, our universe is more than 10 billion years old, so if something lasts 10 to 100 million years, that's just a very short amount of time. But what happens is if that neutron star has a companion star, a star like our sun, for instance, eventually that star will continue to evolve. It burns fuel in, inside in, with a nuclear fusion. As it turns into a red giant, it transfers material in, in, the, in the form of a disk onto the neutron star, and that transfer of material also transfers angular momentum, which means that you spin that star, the neutron star, faster and faster. And it also makes the magnetic field a lot less strong. It kind of varies in some way that we don't fully understand part of that magnetic field. So you end up getting a neutron star that spins very rapidly up to the fastest one that we know, uh, which we actually found with the Green Meg Telescope, is spinning, spinning 716 times per second. So hundreds of times per second. That's faster than a kitchen blender spins. Um, and then these things then can last forever because once you spin them that fast with a much smaller magnetic field, they'll last for billions of years rather than just tens of millions of years. And so once you create these things, once you recycle these neutron stars, uh, they can last forever basically. And so we can see them then throughout the galaxy. Second pulsars. Well, this, these are the questions that I would be asking in class. I will ask you to please uh, read them, answer them. And I'm not going to give you the answer because they might be in the, your next quiz, so I want you to study them. And that was it for section 13. Now let us go to section 14, chapter 13. Well, we continue looking at the production of elements as we have seen um, due to a series of fusions in large stars. Um, there's a lot of elements that are being produced all the way to iron, but uh, heavier elements can be obtained from um, colliding neutron stars. Remember, neutron stars are, have uh, nuclear density, so they are like a giant nucleus. And when they collide among with one another, they can produce uh, they they fragment into pieces that can, that uh, will produce uh, very heavy elements. And of course, this uh, we have now we have seen neutron stars, and, and I'm going to run a video showing you that. But um, before, everything that we knew or suspected came from uh, computer simulations. And uh, here we have an example, the formation of an isotope of thulium requires neutron densities that are only available in neutron stars. This is uh, the video that I'm going to run that tells you about uh, what happens when neutron stars collide. Every day or two, on average, satellites detect a massive explosion somewhere in the sky. These are gamma-ray bursts, the brightest blasts in the universe. They're thought to be caused by jets of matter moving near the speed of light associated with the births of black holes. Gamma-ray bursts that last longer than two seconds are the most common and are thought to result from the death of a massive star. Shorter bursts prove much more elusive. In fact, even some of their basic properties were unknown until NASA's SWIFT satellite began work in 2004. Astronomers suspected that crashing neutron stars could explain short bursts. 
A neutron star is what remains when a star several times the mass of the Sun collapses and explodes. With more than the Sun's mass packed into a sphere less than 18 miles across, these objects are incredibly dense. Just a sugar cube-sized piece of neutron star can weigh as much as all the water in the Great Lakes. When two orbiting neutron stars collide, they merge and form a black hole, releasing enormous amounts of energy in the process. Armed with state-of-the-art supercomputer models, scientists have shown that colliding neutron stars can produce the energetic jet required for a gamma-ray burst. Earlier simulations demonstrated that mergers could make black holes. Others had shown that the high-speed particle jets needed to make a gamma-ray burst would continue if placed in the swirling wreckage of a recent merger. Now, the simulations reveal the middle step of the process, how the merging star's magnetic field organizes itself into outwardly directed components capable of forming a jet. The Damiana supercomputer at Germany's Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics needed six weeks to reveal the details of a process that unfolds in just 35 thousandths of a second. The new simulation shows two neutron stars merging to form a black hole surrounded by superhot plasma. On the left is a map of the density of the stars as they scramble their matter into a dense hot cloud of swirling debris. On the right is a map of the magnetic fields, with blue representing magnetic strength a billion times greater than the sun's. The simulation shows the same disorderly behavior of the matter and magnetic fields. Both structures gradually become more organized, but what's important here is the white magnetic field. Amidst this incredible turmoil, the white field has taken on the character of a jet, although no matter is flowing through it when the simulation ends. Showing that chaotic magnetic fields suddenly become organized as jets provides scientists with the missing link. It confirms that merging neutron stars can indeed produce short gamma-ray bursts. At this moment, somewhere across the cosmos, it's about to happen again. Well, this is, it was a big event when the two neutron stars, uh, where, the, where the collision of two neutron stars was, was detected. Uh, such a big event made it to the, to the news. So this is a report from PBS from uh, October 18, 2017, that tells you uh, what happens. Uh, textbook changer, they say. And indeed, we have a new version of our... Astrophysicists and astronomers all over the world are celebrating a golden moment this week. The announcement of a scientific finding that has Nobel Prize written all over it. They witnessed the collision of two incredibly dense neutron stars and found a scientific holy grail in the process. It provides further proof that Albert Einstein was a genius, relatively speaking. The findings help us understand the universe better. And as a result, we now know where all the gold and silver and platinum in the world comes from. It's the focus of our leading edge segment this week and science correspondent Miles O'Brien joins me now. Miles, tell me why are they so excited about this? It's a textbook changer, Hari. It happened in August and it began with two observations. One of gravitational waves, ripples in space-time if you will, followed right on its heels by the uh, recording of a gamma ray burst. This set off this amazing scientific full court press that led to this discovery. The focus of all this, Hari, are neutron stars and the collision of two of them. Neutron stars are what is left over after a supernova, a star burns out. These things are the densest things we know of in the universe. Uh, these, uh, at the focus of this story, were about the size of Boston, and yet they have a mass that is 50% greater than our sun. They're relatively rare to have two of them collide. It happens only about once every 100,000 years in our galaxy, the Milky Way, Hari. So did we just get lucky? Did all these people just get lucky when these kind of all their beepers and bells and whistles started going off that something was afoot? Well, luck favors the prepared scientist, I guess, in this case. It began with the LIGO instrument. This team just recently won the Nobel Prize for a discovery in 2015 of these gravitational waves, wrinkles in space, time, that uh, proved out Einstein's theory of relativity. 
it did that by detecting the collision of black holes. Now, in our business of television, we prefer our science illustrated. Uh, so when they discovered that there might possibly be a collision of neutron stars, that includes an explosion and some light, and that made people feel uh, a little more excited. In August, the LIGO instrument detected one of these gravitational waves, but it was ever so slightly different. It happened a little longer because these neutron stars move a little slower than black holes. Another instrument, subsequently, the Fermi, which is an orbiting instrument, detected a gamma ray burst. Scientists thought they were hot on the trail of one of these elusive neutron star collisions, and so they started scrambling. Edo Berger is part of the team. He's at Harvard University. As soon as we received uh, an alert from the LIGO uh, instruments telling us that they detected a gravitational wave source, uh, we started calling up observatories all over the world where we have uh, uh, programs that are ready to go uh, for that purpose. Uh, we gave them the coordinates uh, of the source on the sky where they would have to point a telescope. Uh, and as soon as they uh, pointed a telescope in that direction, we could look at the images coming in. Working together, the gravitational wave astronomers and the light wave astronomers were able to kind of pinpoint this location very quickly, sort of triangulate in on the galaxy where it was happening, a galaxy that is 130 million light years away. And it turns out it was much more than a light show. Once they're able to find it and they watch this explosion unfold, they're able to really uh, record the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And in it, they were able to see the distinct signatures of all kinds of elements, including these heavy elements, gold, silver, and platinum, proving that's where those, that furnace, that explosion, is what creates those particular elements. So now that we know where some of these heavy elements come from, what do scientists do with that information? Well, um, it would be nice to go out and get the gold, wouldn't it, Harry? <laughs> it's 130 million light years away. It's a little bit of a problem. Somebody actually calculated how much gold would have been created by this particular collision. Just so you know, it comes out to about 10 octillion dollars worth. That's, that's one followed by 27 zeros. So we could quit our day jobs if we could get out there, Hari. Um, but obviously, scientists are not as focused on the gold itself. For them, knowledge is gold. Duncan Brown is a physics professor at Syracuse University. This really is a, a new type of astronomy. We're now bringing together all the tools that, that humans have to bear on observing the universe. We can feel the ripples in space time. Um, we can see the light from things colliding out there in the universe and exploding and the light from stars. And bringing all these tools together is going to allow us to learn so much more about the universe. You know, give me a sense of this collaboration. I mean, right now in the United States, we can't get two parties to agree on something, but you're talking about different teams from all over the world responding at the drop of a hat. Yes, and there are cases where astronomers will line up observatories to look at events and they collaborate on these things. But as best we can tell, this is unprecedented in its scope and its speed of response. It was really lightning fast once the word got out. About 70 observatories ultimately were pointed at this unprecedented event. Now, all this happened just last August, but really it happened when the dinosaurs were walking around. Yeah, it's a little bit of a mind bender. When you look at this event, 130 million light years away, it took that long for the light to reach us. So really it happened 130 million years ago. And that gives you an idea of how old the universe and also gives you an idea of how these particles which are created so far away ultimately have really great meaning to us. We end up wearing them. It's bling. <laughs> right. Miles O'Brien, thanks so much. You're welcome, Hari. This is section uh, 1315. And here we're going to see that uh, Binary neutron stars can create uh, X-rays, but uh, not only just flashes of X-rays, but pulses of X-rays. And neutron stars can produce those pulses. And how do we find them? Well, uh, in 1970, there was a satellite that was launched uh, with the uh, name U Uru, which means uh, freedom in so. Sahili, Sahili, and uh, it operated from 70 to 73, but it located 339 
X ray sources. This is one example, and you can see the periodicity of, of, the, pulse, of the pulses, of the X ray pulses, as a function of time. So they are pulsating X ray sources. This, is, this in particular is uh, data from uh, Centaurus uh, X3. And the fact that it increases and decreases in amplitude means little because uh, what, what, what happened was that uh, the satellite was rotating and was collecting data from the side and then from the front and then from the back again. So the, um, this is somewhat artificial, but uh, we can rely on the periodicity of the signal and um, these the the periods are extremely short which means well short in the sense of you know a few seconds which means that the source is very compact and it is spinning very fast and in fact uh, Centaurus X3 is an eclipsing binary and the source takes uh, 12 hours to pass behind the companion star so you can see that um, that this comes from uh, all the gas that is being dropped into a neutron star and as it gets accelerated it produces the x-rays. This is a model that explains the pulsation of um, x-rays. It's a binary system. You have a neutron star here. You have a, uh, an ordinary star that has filled up his Rothschild lobe and the gas that is being transferred to the neutron star it is being pulled by the uh, large gravity of, of uh, the neutron star and uh, increases the, the speed of the gas as it comes in and creates a hot spot that uh, reaches 100 million degrees Kelvin and when it crashes produces x-rays that go in all directions but uh, uh, it, preferably they escape in um, these two uh, beams of uh, x-rays cre uh, creating a pulsating x-ray source again the neutron star is so compact that it ranges in size between 100 meters to all the way to uh, 4 kilometers and um, in this case the rotation of, uh, of um, no this is for a different case the, the neutron star in Hercules 6-1 Complete is one completes one rotation in 1.24 seconds, so it's extremely fast. These are the questions for section 15. I urge you to study them. You might encounter them in the in the quiz. <coughs> More questions, and I believe this is the end of uh, section 15.